Hello, and welcome back to Think Yourself Healthy podcast. I'm your host, Heather Barbieri. Before we dive into this episode, I just want to remind you that if you take a screenshot that you're listening and tag us on Instagram, we'll send you a 15% off discount for the eight week retrain your brain program. Just take a screenshot and tag me at Heather Barbieri RDN. Thanks for listening and let's get right to it. Hello, everybody. On today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy, I have special guest David Newman. I recently participated in a nutrition culinary conference and came across David. He was a guest speaker, and I was literally blown away by the information he presented to everyone on this conference. So I immediately Googled him, found a way to contact and reach him, and he was so kind to accept the invitation to come on the podcast. So David, thank you so much for being here with us today. Great. Thank you, Heather, for having me. So David, tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what qualifies you to speak about olive oil. Sure. Um, So I've been in the food industry my entire life, uh, say professionally over 35 years primarily in the natural, organic, specialty foods world. Um, Notably, the last 17 years, I've been an olive oil executive. Going back to 2006, I was president and partner of Lucini Italia, which is a preeminent uh, brand of high-quality extra virgin olive oil that I grew to very large size and sold that company to um, California Olive Ranch in 2015. Um, In that journey, which was a uh, a long learning experience, I became... Um, a professional olive oil taster, uh, trained at the O'Neill School in Imperia, Italy. Uh, has started the training there in 2011. Um, I graduated as a professional in 2018, and I've been re- re- remain my, um, my accreditation since 2018, returning every year to Italy for my uh, annual re- retraining. Um, on top of that, I was a CEO of Gaia North America, which is a Greek olive oil brand for four years. And then I kind of semi-retired and decided that I needed to consult um, and learn really what consumers really understood or didn't understand about olive oil. So that journey started in 2018 and where most executives decide to stay in the top of uh, their career, I decided to get very granular, get on the streets. I created the first ever mobile olive oil tasting truck called Evo Guy Truck. And I set out for a couple of years, Heather, to do pre-COVID olive oil events, um, olive oil tastings, food and wine events, where I was bringing various high quality olive oils to consumers to teach them how to taste. What is the difference between a typical supermarket olive oil that claims to be extra virgin and a real extra virgin olive oil? Uh, Learning all of their feedback, listening, answering questions, helping them, creating my own brand in the process, and ultimately started writing a book about this entire journey um, through the very beginning at Lucini, all the way through consulting, and um, published that book um, this June was the publishing date, uh, Extra Virgin Olive Oil, the truth, of, the truth in Your Kitchen, which tells about the whole journey of what extra virgin olive oil is and is not, and how retailers and some brands use a lot of sleight of hand to um, trick consumers in America particularly to believe that the product in the bottle is extra virgin when likely it isn't. So um, I've used all my knowledge and all my passion to bring this to the consumer in a very easy to read, very um, executable fashion to teach themselves how to smell and taste olive oil. And now I, I kind of run a food company in my day job, but I still stay very involved in the olive oil world, both in speaking engagements, um, teaching, um, international judge, don't do really any consulting anymore, but uh, still maintain my own brand. And um, at the high, highest level, um, I believe that I'm one of the, few experts in America that actually speak the truth about this uh, category. Yeah. And that's what I was so impressed about with the presentation that you did for as you know, registered dietitian nutritionist. I thought I knew a lot about olive oil and then I was literally blown away. I am very aware of the corruption that exists within our food system here, specifically in the United States. um, And When I was introduced to this kind of information or similar circumstances back as early as 2016, I was just absolutely shocked, 
you know, absolutely heartbroken <laughs> that this is the truth of what consumers are facing here in the United States. And basically, you have to be a trained expert in the event you want to really know how to purchase food that's going to be in your best interest. Mm -hmm. So why is it that the U.S. olive oil industry is so resistant to providing real extra virgin olive oil to the public? Kind of talk to us about how, where is the corruption? How are we being duped here when we're going into the stores and thinking that, you know, we're purchasing this delicious, healthy, extra virgin olive oil that's going to be so good and beneficial for our heart and our overall health. Yeah, it is. It is tragic. And unfortunately, and I may relate to this to um, to you in our in our presentation, that America is one of only three countries in the world that doesn't um, fall under the guidance of the IOC, the International Olive Council, which was formed in the 1980s. Um, by the United Nations to harmonize extra virgin olive oil standards around the world so that we're all speaking the same language. Like the mm -hmm. world organic is today in America, before 2002, it didn't mean anything. It had no weight. The government didn't oversee it. So everybody took their own opinion of what organic was, and it really was a bunch of trickery. Consumers were like, why am I paying more for something that's supposed to be organic but may not be certified organic? So the US, um, USDA uh, made that law in 2002. They have not done that with olive oil. So in the rest of the world, the IOC oversees the standards, the regulations, and the um, policing, if you will, of the olive oil world. Australia, Brazil, and the United States are the three countries that do not participate. So the USDA has their own voluntary standard that I think we reviewed together, and I mentioned mm -hmm. about it in my book, and it's also easily available on the website. You Google it, uh, USDA Olive Oil Act of 2010. And basically, it's a voluntary standard that says to producers, if you want to launch a product that's called extra virgin olive oil, it may not have any defects whatsoever that are organoleptically or sensorily determined by a professional like me. But also, there's a whole list of criteria that are chemical analyses that must also be met because the word extra virgin is the highest standard of olive oil, and it only goes down from there. So there's a certain mm -hmm. price that has to cost. There's a certain standard of, of flavor and bitter and pungency that it has to deliver. And if it doesn't have that, it doesn't matter what the label says. It doesn't matter where you bought it. It likely is not extra virgin. And therein lies the fraud that both mm -hmm. re brands that put, put the name extra virgin on the bottle that isn't extra virgin or the retailers that sell it either knowingly or unknowingly that it is an extra virgin. Both of those are duping the consumer. And if you're not a trained or aware consumer, you are being taken advantage of. You are consuming either rancid or defective olive oil, which is not healthy for you. You're not getting what you pay mm -hmm. for. So I likened it to kind of fresh produce or fresh meat. We know how to shop for fresh cut meat or fresh fish by smelling it or looking at the eyes and the gills. We know if we mm -hmm. buy a tomato that's full of mold, we wouldn't eat it. But when you see all these mysterious bottles of olive oil with all these interesting claims and all these you know, pictures of peasants picking the olives and it says it's from Italy, but is it made in Italy? Is it Tunisian olives? Um, all of that trickery still exists today on the shelves. So if you're not an aware consumer, you most likely are being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So how is it that they're able to get away with this? Well, because there is no standard of identity, an SOI. The government has okay. not um, assigned an SOI, like juice has an SOI. There's lemonade, mm -hmm. lemon juice, and lemon drink. And all of those are managed by an SOI. However, there is no SOI for olive oil. So we know what olive oil should be, but if there's nobody regulating it, then it's up to the consumer to, to do their own homework and make sure that they're not um, perpetuating the problem by buying into fraudulently labeled product. Right, and we know how much time everyone has to dive in and do that kind of research, right? To ensure that they're purchasing the best product. <laughs> likely, yeah, likely not going to happen. So. This is this is very alarming. So so with these all these fraudulent olive oils that are being labeled as extra virgin olive oil, what are the what are the problems? Why should we be concerned with purchasing high quality extra virgin olive oil versus what is actually most likely on sitting on the shelf? Sure. Well, um, you're a, a dietitian and you have this podcast, and I'm sure you talk about quality, authenticity, and healthfulness of product. There's very little product that we consume that gets any better with age. Maybe balsamic mm -hmm. vinegar and red wine. 
But other than that, everything starts to decay the minute it's either picked or produced. So when you see produce in the supermarket, it could be months old, sitting in like, you know, storage containers coming from abroad. That product is not getting any better sitting around. The fresher mm -hmm. we eat the food, the better it is for us. And primarily we eat for sustenance. I mean, of course we eat for pleasure, but we eat to sustain ourselves, to have a healthy life, to have a long life, to enjoy the food that we prepare or that we consume. Olive oil is a foundational ingredient in our diets. There's no question. We have to cook with fat. Fat trans mm -hmm. transfers heat. There's saturated fats and there's monounsaturated fats and there's um, all kinds of fats in between. Our brain uses fat as an energy source. So we must have healthy fats to fuel our body, to cook our food. Would you want a saturated fat or animal fat that isn't necessarily so healthy, that's high cholesterol? Or do you want a monounsaturated fat that's uh, a plant-based, that's um, high in polyphenols, high in antioxidants, that when you consume it, it not only helps you prepare your food, makes your food taste better, but is actually good for you. It has nutrit nutritive benefits. Very rarely can you find a food that measures all of those um, deliverables. So then the question is, how fresh is the olive oil that I'm using? Is it all the same? If it all says extra virgin and a bottle is buy one, get one free for $7 or another bottle says single estate and it's $20, they both say extra virgin. Is it the same thing? Are they both healthy? Mm -hmm. What I teach in the book and what I am talking to you about today is that not all extra virgin is created equal. Price is an arbiter of quality, like in most things in life. You can buy cheap diamond or you can buy nice diamond. You can buy a cheap car, you can buy a nice car. You can buy cheap extra virgin olive oil that probably isn't extra virgin, but says so, or you can buy real extra virgin. And the only real, truly classical way a consumer can know that and actually benefit from it is that trusting your nose and trusting your mouth, training yourself to understand what is quality. You don't have to be a professional taster like me, but you do have to learn how to smell and taste olive oil because likely it's got defects and defects are very easy to pick up when you know what you're looking for. If you don't, mm -hmm. and uh, Heather, I've done this thousands of times. Consumers taste a product that they think is extra virgin. And I say, what is it? They go, olive oil. I said, well, olive oil and extra virgin olive oil are not the same. What is it? It's extra virgin. I said, how do you know? Well, because that's what I think extra virgin tastes like. I said, if I told you that it had defects and was rancid and fusty, would you agree? They go, I don't know what that means. I said, so I taste it as a professional. It's defective. It's not extra virgin. They go, well, I wouldn't know that. I said, of course. So you are now buying a product that you think is extra virgin. You think it has health benefits. You think it's fresh, but it isn't. It's mm -hmm. susceptible to heat, air, light, and time, the HALT acronym that we talked about on our, mm -hmm. um, on our conference last week. So if the oil gets hot, if it has air in the bottle, if it's a clear glass and has light, or it's been sitting around for too long time, any one of those or a combination of those will decay the oil from its original form, could be quality, could be low quality, or um, it would be rendered inedible. And that's called lampante, which means it's an unrefined olive oil that has enough defects where it is no longer fit for human consumption. And I will tell you, without being held to this number, 20 to 30% of all the olive oil in America is lampante that people buy every single day and pour all over their food, and it is unfit for wow. consumption. Wow. Wow. So my goal... That, that is, when you shared this information, it, it like actually made my stomach turn. My husband is a trained chef. He's from Italy himself. He's Italian. And he's been preaching to me for, you know, quite some time about how to recognize good olive oil versus bad mm -hmm. olive oil. And he says all the time, Heather, it's almost impossible to find good quality olive oil here in the United States. And that's, you know, a lot of the stuff that's being imported from Italy. So how do consumers, how can consumers take the power back when it comes to their purchasing decisions um, with the process by educating themselves on such a pivotal ingredient in our pantry? My goal is to not scare people and detour them from wanting to consume such a, you know, highly potential uh, health food. So I really want them to feel empowered walking away from this conversation today so that they know what they're looking for when they go to the grocery store. Of course. And I, I completely agree. I'm not looking to scare anybody, but the truth is the truth. And the right. book is called The Truth in Your Kitchen is because I've done, like I said, almost 20 years of research 
I've written the book. There's been no challenge. There's no legal issues, but no threats because I wrote the truth. I've had it, you know, completely edited and verified. So this isn't my opinion. This is fact. Um, the reason that America gets away with it is not only do we not have a standard of identity, but we only produce 5% of the olive oil that we need in America, in California, and a little bit in Georgia. Um, that means we're importing 95% of our olive oil. We are the largest import of olive oil in the world. It's 400,000 metric tons. So how is the government going to stop all this olive oil pouring into this country without a standard, with consumers expecting it, and then our consumption is very low. We consume less than a liter per, per person per year. In Italy, where your husband's from, it's 14 liters per person. In Greece, it's 24 liters per person. So we have low consumption, we have high demand, and we have no regulation. All of that is fodder for fraud. So now you have these big companies that see America as a dumping ground for all of the oil they can't legally sell abroad. But America will take it because we don't have a rule. We don't have a government overseeing it. So the retailers bring it in because, one, they have to have it. Two, the consumers want it. And three, they can make a good market on it. So there is a market that wants this product. Now, to your point, how can a consumer take the power back? A modicum of education is necessary in a lot of things. I mean, we learn how to drive. We learn how to shop. We learn how to do a lot of things in our lives to get you know, out of uh, being a, a child or young person, being into an adult. At that point, when they're in college, they need to start learning to take control over a lot of the decisions. Um, part of that is, you know, how to shop, how to cook, how to save, et cetera, et cetera. In the shopping world, and we all have to shop for the next, you know, years until we're in a home that we're being fed, we have to know when we eat in restaurants, what quality we're getting. We have to know how to shop. We have to know how to cook. Um, extra virgin olive oil is one of these foods that you don't have to cook with. You can use it raw. You can dip with it. You can use it with bread, crudite. It's a wonderful, amazing food that is a condiment as much as it is um, a staple in the pantry but you have to know what you're doing. Resources, you, um, other talented uh, dietitians that know right from wrong. My website, evoguy.com. I have a, re a reference section in there, which lists uh, retailers that you can trust, brands that are more trustworthy, um, how much you should pay. The lower you pay, the lower quality you're gonna get. So if you are on a budget, spend what you think is right for you, but don't expect a Ferrari for the price of a Kia. It's not gonna happen. Okay. So price is an arbiter. The higher the price, likely the better the quality. But the caveat is that oil could still have been, you know, um, damaged through heat, light, air, and time. So even if it started as great, it could end up on the shelf as terrible. Not unlike a bottle of cork wine that you spend a lot of money for, and it turns out it's not drinkable. So you have to know how to smell and taste. That is taking the power back. And once you know what extra virgin olive oil smells and tastes like, and that you like it, any time that you either buy a bottle or you're given a bottle at a restaurant, a cruet on the table, you smell and taste it on a spoon at the restaurant. If it's bad, say, no, thank you. I, I just won't have it. If you buy a bottle from the store and you open it and you smell it, you taste it, say, it's not good. You take it back to the store, you bring your receipt and say, I want my money back. I'm going to try something else. That is taking the power back. That is not being a sheep. That is being mm -hmm. taking control over their decisions that knows how to evaluate what they've purchased. Not unlike if you bought a bottle of milk a, 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 a container of milk and it was spoiled, you wouldn't consume it. You would take it back. Say it's spoiled. It somehow didn't stay cold. It's still in the shelf life. I don't want it. I'm taking it back. Same should you too with the olive oil. Mm -hmm. Such a great point. You know, it's interesting because when I'm having conversations with a lot of people, consumers, they honestly don't really even know the difference between extra virgin olive oil and olive oil. Can you speak to that to just give that basic education? Sure. So olive oil is a ubiquitous term, the olive oil industry. I have written about it. A lot of people write about it or just say olive oil. Well, olive oil actually is a, a, a product called olive oil, which is a blend of virgin olive oil, which is the first pressing of the olive, not extra virgin, virgin, which is the gray below, has slight defects, and refined olive oil. So in the US um, USDA standard, there's unrefined and refined. And unrefined is the first pressing by mechanical means without the use of heat, pressure, or chemicals to extract the oil from the olive. They just basically, they, they, they wash them, they crush them, they send them through a malaxer, which is like a giant mixer that separates the oil from the water, from the pumice, which is the solid. 
And that oil then is the first press of the olive oil. That then gets through decantation, it's separated, and then they filter it. Hopefully they filter it and you have this clear extra virgin olive oil, but it's only extra virgin if it's been tested, which all olive oil must be tested by humans to make sure there's no defects and then the chemical tests. If there's a mm-hmm. problem, it can be virgin. If it's worse than virgin, it's Lampante, as I mentioned, lamp oil. It's not edible. That would go to the refinery. They would clean it up using hexane as a solvent, pressure and heat, clean it up to a base oil that has no smell and no flavor, and then they would add a little bit of virgin oil to it to make it olive oil or light or pure. And those are refined products. They're chemically produced products. They don't have almost any flavor. They have almost no health benefits. And I would never recommend using them raw. At best, fry them mm-hmm. at best. So the difference is mm-hmm. olive oil is a combination of virgin and refined. Extra virgin is the highest quality of a raw, perfect olive oil. So when I say perfect, I mean zero defects. I don't even mean one, mm-hmm. 10, I mean zero. If you look mm-hmm. at all those bottles in a grocery store, plastic bottles that are $4, how can it be perfect for $4 in a plastic bottle? Um, when you open it and smell it, if it smells like varnish, nail polish, paint, wax, crayons, lipstick, toe jam, belly button lint, salami, (laughs) vomit, baby diapers. Those are not good smells. That means there's a defect. And every defect has an associated aroma, which I'm trained to smell. But as a consumer, your listeners can open a bottle. They can smell and go, oh, my God, this smells like vomit. That is not extra virgin olive oil. Put the cap on it and take it away. Yeah, it, it was actually, honestly, it was mind blowing to me when you were showing the visuals of the process that most olive oil that makes it here to the United States goes through. And there's like eight different processes to get it here on the shelves. Well, I guess the shelves would probably be the ninth process, right? So that was really frightening for me. I was like, oh my gosh, I never took that into perspective because I guess in my mind, I thought here we are protected. You know, the olive oil is literally going through maybe a one, two, three step process to get to the shelves here for us to consume. So that was really, really eye opening seeing that I'm a visual learner. So seeing those kind of visuals were really just mind blowing and put things into perspective and said, okay, I really need to take a step back here and really consider when I'm in the store, how that product got to that place. And I absolutely loved the acronym that you came up with HALT, you know, the heat, air, light and time. I thought that was just absolutely amazing. Yeah. You know, I I don't blame you when you say consumers don't have the time or really the interest in learning all of this. I don't blame them. People are busy. I get it. That's why Mm -hmm. either you have to trust a retailer, which in this case you can't do. Um, You have to trust a brand, which in this case you cannot do. Or you have to learn to trust yourself. And Mm -hmm. something like an iPhone, you know, we don't know how they make these phones, but we know how to use them. We know right. how to open them. We know how to use the features to some degree, better or worse. We understand apps a little bit. We've had to learn how to use this technology to better our life. But I can't tell you how they make it or where they make it or what goes through to make it. All I know is I buy the phone. I use it the way that I've been trained to use it, and it makes my life better. So the mm-hmm. olive oil is a lot the same. If you buy a reputable product and it's coming from a reputable source, you don't really have to worry about all the trouble that go to making it. What you want is a really good product for the money that you're paying. And some of the things Mm -hmm. we talked about, like on my bottle, some of the key factors are um, 100% Spanish. This is a single country. You do not want something that says Med Blend or Mediterranean Blend, or on the back says, where it says product of Spain, it may say, may contain all oils from Tunisia, Morocco, Spain, Greece, Italy, uh, you know, um, uh, Morocco, wherever. That means Mm -hmm. oils have been shipped all over and they've been damaged in transit, and they're blending them together. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they ship them here, and they blend them in the East Coast, and they come in from all over the world. Those olives are guaranteed to be damaged. Um, I put the harvest year. This is the harvest, the last harvest of 21, 22. Most producers won't do that because they don't want the bottles to seem like they're out of date when the next harvest comes. But this mm-hmm. is your indication, one, that this is a serious product. I'm willing to put the date on here when it was harvested, and it's the most recent harvest. And remember, olive oil doesn't get better with age. So if this was right. the harvest of 2021, it's a year older. If it's a harvest of 1920, it's not edible. Mm. Be grown. 
means it's grown on a single estate. Hand-picked means the olives are picked by hand, not by machines. It's a monocultivar Pequal, so it's one olive in this bottle. Blends are not bad, you know, called a coupage. It's okay, mm -hmm. but in this case, I'm telling you it's a one olive Pequal. Um, it's green, robust, fruity, so it gives you an indication of the intensity that when you taste it, it's mm -hmm. going to be quite strong and bitter. So I've, in I've indicated on this panel a lot of important information. What's less mm -hmm. important is the best before dates. Okay, so the best before dates, which are on the back of these bottles, which was March of 2024, is not necessarily relevant, even though brands put this on there. Is my two years, this means this was bottled in March of 22. So they put two mm -hmm. years on it for bottling, which is typical. If my bottle is $30 and I have two year shelf life and it's packed with nitrogen and a dark bottle and I send it over here on a temperature controlled container, doing everything right, then how can a bottle for $5 that has the same two-year shelf life still last two years if it's not nearly the quality and not nearly as protected as my bottle? That is part of the shenanigans. They want you to believe mm -hmm. this product is still good for two years. It may not even be good from the day they made it. Forget about the two years. So I just right. think forget about the best before date. Look for the stuff that's important. The harvest date, the hand pick, the estate. The, the description of the flavors. This means a production is serious. A lot of the other phony baloney stuff on these bottles that makes you believe you're getting some kind of uh, authentic product is all marketing, you know, hoo-ha that they mm -hmm. have believe that they can hoodwink you into believing that it's extra virgin. Yeah, so I, you just, I am so impressed with what you just shared and here's why. One of the concerns that I have had with everything that we have experienced over these last two years with COVID is that so many people's taste and smell have been impacted. Mm -hmm. So if the only way that we can ensure that we're, you know, consuming high quality olive oils through taste and smell, that's pretty frightening for a huge percentage of the population right now who, you know, either have temporary or potentially permanent alterations of their olfactory system. Yeah. So these tips are absolute gold. I'm talking gold. I know for myself, I already feel more empowered being able to pick up a bottle of olive oil, check those boxes and say, okay, I can feel pretty confident here that this is going to be a high quality bottle and then taking it to the next step, which would be the smell and the taste. Would you like to speak a little bit to that of what consumers can do in terms of being able to smell and taste to ensure quality? Sure. Um, do you want me to take you through that real quick? Absolutely. Okay. So the official tasting cups that I think I used in our, in our gathering, which consumers would not have are these, what's called the blue tulip glass. This is the official tasting glass of okay. an oleologist or a sensory expert like me. And the reason okay. they do this blue and they're also in red is they don't want you to see the color of the oil when it's brought mm. out. Because if you see a green oil, that could um, affect your opinion of it. Thinking green is mm. better, but it could be dyed green. So mm. they don't. When, when you're doing professional tasting or judging, they don't want you to see the oil. And when you pour oil okay. in here and you put the lid on there to protect the aromas and you warm it up, you don't see what you're tasting. And I have a grading sheet and I can do a blind. That's what I've been trained to do. Wow. In school, this is the little sample cups of my school. You can see the name of the school in Italian. And these are biodegradable and they have a little measure line at the bottom here, which is um, basically a 15 ml pour, which is mm -hmm. um, a one tablespoon. So I'll open okay. up, this is my little mini bottle. Of this is my okay. olive oil. And um, you can see I'm opening it fresh. So that means the nitrogen is now being released. Oxygen mm -hmm. is coming in. So now the clock is really ticking. All right. Okay. Pour a little bit into a cup, basically, you know, a, 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 a tablespoon. At home, you can do this in any glass. It could be a wine glass. It could be a shot glass. It just has to have an opening, Heather, that you could actually cover with your hand. So mm -hmm. if it's like too big for your palm and you can't seal in the aromas, you're not going to experience all of the um, aromatics that you're looking for. So okay. let's say you're at home. You bought this bottle. You, you read David's book. It says you must smell and taste this oil before you use it because it could be bad. So I poured the oil in my cup. Um, I, I'm back from the store. I'm warming it up. And this is one thing that Americans don't like to do is just put olive oil in their mouth. Well, mm -hmm. we need two tablespoons a day for optimal health. So this isn't going to hurt us by taking a, a, a good swig of olive oil as long as it's good olive oil. If it's bad, mm -hmm. we're not doing ourselves any favors. So I warm it up, bring it to my body temperature, and I can smell the aromas 
already emanating. And I like the cheat, the cheating that I told you, taught you in our little class was if you can smell it from your chin, it's a robust oil. And I can smell my oil from my chin, about three inches. So that means it's a robust green oil. If I have to bring it to my lips, it's a medium fruity. That means I have to bring it closer to smell it. And if I have to go all the way in and smell it like this, it's mild fruity. And there's nothing wrong okay. with mild, medium, or robust. It just depends on what you like. And there's mm -hmm. some applications like with a flounder or fresh fish that a green oil like this is too strong. It would overwhelm mm -hmm. the fish. And so you want a milder oil, like a Sicilian Nocellar de Bellici, which is a milder oil, a little sweeter. And I don't mean sweet like candy sweet. I mean sweet like ripe sweet, like a ripe banana mm -hmm. sweet versus green grass sweet. So as I'm smelling it, I'm looking for the telltale signs of extra virgin. Green grassy or ripe fruity, no signs of defects. I'm not smelling waxy or nail polish or any of those ugly defects I talked about. It smells vegetal, um, maybe like an artichoke leaf or green tomato. It smells very pleasant. So that's the first check mark. I don't have any defects in my nose. But there could be defects in the mouth. There are a number of defects where you don't taste, smell them, but you taste them. So we have to taste mm -hmm. them really quickly. And... I always keep an extra cup here because if the oil is bad, I would spit it out. I would not okay. spit bad oil. And I have to eat a lot of bad oil as a professional taster as part of my training. Hopefully, yeah. customers aren't going to do this. But I did ask you guys to try oil at home. And I don't know what people had. They didn't want to disclose it. But I'm sure a lot of people had some pretty bad oil. Yeah. <laughs> when they taste it, I don't drink olive oil like a beverage. Um, it's a fat. So I'm going to move it around my palate. I'm going to what we call chew on it. I'm going to move it around my palate. I'm going to experience the bitterness, which good olive oil should have a bitterness on the tongue. And then as I, um, I will slurp on it and it'll make this awful sound, but I'm vaporizing it in the back of my throat and I'm accelerating the pungency, which is the pepperiness in the back of your throat, which is the sign that it's full of polyphenols, that it's alive, that it's healthy. And that's not taste. That's a feeling. Okay. Mm. It, taste is, so you have smell in your nose. Taste in your mouth and the pungency in your throat. Three different experiences. So I've qualified this on my nose. It's extra virgin so far. I'm going to taste it. So the oil's in my mouth. You can't see it, but it's in my mouth. It's quite bitter. It's quite green. My mouth is vibrant. It's alive. It's confirming what my nose told me. And as I slurp it, <coughs> and as I swallow it, the pungency kicks in. This oil mm -hmm. is quite high in polyphenols. When I tested it, seven or 800 polyphenols, which is extremely high. That means it's got all the good anti-inflammatories and antioxidants that we need, which are not naturally occurring in our body. Mm -hmm. I, I just drank olive oil. My mouth is clear. My lips are not waxy. I don't feel like a Carmax or chapstick on my lips. My tongue is clear. Uh... It's gone. So I swallow the extra virgin mm -hmm. because it's good quality. Had it been bad, I would have, you know, spit it out and just said, okay, this is no bueno. I would have taken a drink of water, a little bit of green apple, got rid of that nasty flavor. And I would have put the bot lid on the bottle. I said, you know what? It's going back to the store. It's not for me. It's not uh, what they reported it to be. Even mm -hmm. if they packed it as extra virgin and it went bad in transit, it still cannot be sold as extra virgin. It must meet the claim on the label until it meets the best before date. So this bottle, as I showed you, was March of 24. It makes the claim of extra virgin. It must still be extra virgin, even if it was kept in a hot warehouse, even if it was a clear bottle and the light killed it. The law mm -hmm. says it must meet the standard of the PDP, the principal display panel, by the end of the expiration date. So by March of 2024, it still must be extra virgin, even if it was mishandled. So as a okay. consumer, you have a right to buy what they're selling you, which is extra virgin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That simple <laughs> tasting and smelling took us, what, three minutes? Yeah. And if it's... And I you see, I got a great bottle of olive oil. I'm going to use it. Yeah, that, I mean, just amazing. Such great tips. So as a registered dietitian nutritionist, I specialize in mental health and substance abuse. So a lot of the clients that I work with really struggle with bowel function and uh, digestive inflammation. So one of the tips that I like to use with them is recommending taking a tablespoon of pure extra virgin olive oil and swallowing that as a way to help lubricate their bowel to help, you know, promote that, that normal function. And 
often I have witnessed individuals try to do this and they have the waxy lips. They're like, Ooh, is it normal for my lips to, you know, taste so waxy and, and have that uh, really thick tongue feel. So these tips are so fabulous with really being able to help me feel more confident with teaching others how to do this, what to look for, and the benefits of being able to do that raw, you know, extra virgin olive oil. Fabulous. And, and one of the tips in my book, um, the chapter is called um, Your Kitchen, Your Olive Oil. This is my wife using the bottle in a shake. So uh, like, yeah, she adds it to her shake in the morning because she gets that lubrication that women tend to need as they get older, their digestive system slow down. And she yes. takes a full serving of tables of this with um, the other items that she puts in there, like maca and um, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, some kind of berries and whatnot. She makes a smoothie and the olive oil is incorporated in there. So you don't even know that it's there. It doesn't really, you don't pick up the greenness, but she's getting an entire serving in her shake every morning. And, that's you know, fabulous. She's almost 60 and she looks like she's 40. You know, she, uh, that's, that's amazing. But, we age. I mean, you yeah. So food is food is the fuel that we need as we age. So absolutely. Eating good fuel. What are we doing to our bodies? You know, we're going absolutely. to absolutely sooner or later. Absolutely, and such a good point. You know, women have been so fearful of consuming fat based on USDA poor recommendations from so long ago. As you mentioned earlier, we can't produce these omega-3s on our own. We have to get them from our diet. I always tell people I am my best piece of marketing because when people meet me, they're always like, you're how old? I'm, I'm in my mid-40s, and often they you know, think that I am much, much younger than I am. And I owe it. Thank you. I owe it a lot to my diet. I have been focusing on consuming healthy alternatives for um, you know almost 30 years now. I got diagnosed with a kidney disease in 94 and they told me I only had five years to live at that yeah. time. So this was the big motivating factor for me to find alternative options because I couldn't get health insurance for having a pre-existing condition. Oh. And I was able to completely overturn that prognosis. I bought 30 quality years on my life just through the foods and lifestyle practices. So when I came across you and your information, I was just so impressed with your mission. I'm very aware of the corruption that exists within our food industry. It blows my mind when I'm having conversations with people and that this is news to them. We have this false persona here in the United States that we are protected and we're not. We are one of the least protected countries in the world. So I'm curious, what is the incentive for the United States, Australia, and Brazil not to have this governing agency to protect the health and well-being of their, their people? Well, it's a very good question. Um, so Australia and the U.S. Are, are producing countries. Brazil produces a little bit of olive oil, but not much. And they're in the southern hemisphere like Australia. The reason that I understand, and I'm pretty well dialed in, is that the USDA believes that the IOC standard is too weak. So even though it's hmm. an international standard, you got to remember that um, they have to protect producers that make a lot of the shabby olive oil. That's mm -hmm. there is. Let me put it this way: there's not enough real extra virgin olive oil to meet the international demand. So okay, they make this product called extra virgin olive oil that really is an extra virgin. And the IOC mm -hmm. has a standard that is rigorous, no defects, but all the, a lot of the other chemical parameters are much weaker than what the Americas want because California, where we produce olive oil, has a higher standard in California than the IOC has for the oils that they produce in Europe. Now, mm -hmm. those oils meet that standard, which is lower standard than we have in California, and they sell here in America, but they're not overseen by the IOC anymore. That's the confusion, is they have to mm -hmm. meet the IOC standards there but when they sell here, now they fall under the USDA. The USDA standards, just like organic, would be wonderful if they were measured and if they were managed. Mm -hmm. But you know what they say, whatever is managed is met. So, yeah. you know, we have speed limits. Does anybody drive the speed limit until you get pulled over? No. Everyone drives the speed limit <laughs> they want to drive. So it's just like olive oil. They're going to wait until they get slapped on the wrist a few times. And there have been very many numerous lawsuits Clash action suits, retailers get sued, big retailers that you would know or your, your, your viewers would know have settled out of court 
because um, people say, look, I've been buying this product that's called extra virgin. I send it to a lab. It tested. It's not extra virgin. I feel cheated. I got a bunch mm-hmm. of a lawyer. He got a bunch of people together. We want to settle. And those mm-hmm. retailers should go back and look at their sources. A lot of times it's private label where you see it, you know, super cheap because it's our own label, but it's not possible to make uh, a really good bottle, an efficacious bottle for $5. It's not possible. Mm-hmm. So when you see that price, don't think that you're getting a bargain. Just accept that you're being ripped off and move on. Right. Um, and right. When you talk about fat, and I thought it was a very good point. All olive oil is 120 calories. All of them. When you turn over every bottle, it's the same. Okay. So do you want 120 calories of a healthy fat or a terrible fat? That's the difference. Right. Absolutely. Full fat, if I'm going to eat fat, then a terrible, low quality, defective fat that's not going to do anything for my body or my food. Mm, absolutely. It's, it's just mind blowing what, you know, is getting, what is happening in our food industry and through consumers purchasing. I tell people all the time, you know, people say to me, they're like, but Heather, I'm one person. What can I possibly do? And it's like, yo, you have so much potential to make change just being that one person or that one person person. And it all starts with what you're purchasing. We have an immense amount of power through how we're allocating our resources. So I'm curious, um, you know, I was so blown away with so much that you shared that's in your book, in your book. So how can your book and following your IG help solve some of these problems for consumers that, you know, is, is probably top of mind right now as they're listening? Well, my book is very easy to read because I'm not a professional writer. Um, I did have a writing coach, but I wrote it from the point of view of a a person that's in the industry, not as an author or as an investigative journalist. So I find it to be, and people, I've sold thousands of books already. People said it's very easy to read. Um, It's very user-friendly, and there's a lot of anecdotal stories in there about the journey that I've taken. In in fact, admitting that I was bamboozled a number of times as an executive because people thought I'm a dumb American. What does a white American Jew know anything about olive oil? You're not from the Mediterranean. You're not from Greece. What do you know? You, you can't possibly know anything about olive oil. Well, that is really um, naive to say because we can all learn anything we want. And this is just happens to be something that I gravitated to. And I've tried to transpose the realities into um, usable activities through my book, through my website, through my Instagram. Um, I've been on you know numerous of national talk shows this year promoting my book. Every one of those, I feel like I've touched somebody in some way. I get emails every day. You've changed my life. Um, I trust you. You would never betray me. You speak in a simple language. You talk about how I can use the senses I already have. I don't have to go buy any equipment. I don't have to go to school. I don't have to be an expert. Um, But you do have to be willing to smell and taste. Other than that, if you're not willing to smell or taste, and as you said, some people now have um, this COVID affliction, um, long COVID or whatever, where they don't smell and taste, but then look for things on the bottle that are going to reduce the amount of potential um, deceit that you could be buying into. Mm-hmm. And once you buy a good bottle and you start cooking with it and using it, you're going to notice that your food tastes better. Your friends are happier. Family's happier. Um, you feel better. And it's just one simple ingredient in a whole plethora of your diet. You know, mm-hmm. um, things like when people talk about eating beef, and that these, a lot of cows are force-fed corn, which is not indigenous. And it's not good for the corn, cow. It's not good for the environment because of the methane. It's, uh, the cows are meant to eat grass, not corn, but they're fast-fed this corn. And people go and buy beef, whatever, and they don't understand the effect that it's having. What are you doing to yourself? What are you doing to your family? And what are you doing to the environment? And as you just rightly said, you're one person, but there's 300 million of us. And if enough of us get together and make a change, we will start to see change. But if we don't insist on change, do you think the industry is going to change on its own? No. No, absolutely not. No. It's it's too profitable. I mean, come on. It boils down to money, not our health and well-being, which is, you know, the really unfortunate circumstance that we face here on a daily basis with the kind of lobbying that we allow in our systems and ultimately the only way to really make an impact as to where we're spending our money. Right. And one of the biggest problems we have is, you know, I mean, I love Europe and you're obviously married to, to European and I'm sure you travel over there. 
you know, we spend less than 15% of our discretionary income on food. Mm-hmm. The rest of the world, even in poor countries, spend 30, 40% of their income on food. They go marketing every day. They buy food that's seasonal. They buy food that's local. When you go to Italy, you eat Italian food. Maybe mm-hmm. you can find a McDonald's. Maybe you can find a Chinese restaurant. But when you're in Italy, it's Italian food. When you're in Spain, it's Spanish food. When you're in Greece, it's Greek food. When you come to America, you want everything. You want Indian, you know, African tacos. We want everything all the time, no matter where it comes from. There's a price to pay when you eat like that. So as long Absolutely. as you absor- uh, embrace this Mediterranean diet, which we know is foundational in, in healthy living, in long life, in, in prosperous living, if we don't want to embrace a Mediterranean diet, we want to live American lives, we want to go to the grocery store once a week, we want to stock up on all this fresh food that was never fresh to begin with, and we think we're getting nutrient value out of it, the only person you're really cheating is yourself. Mm-hmm. No one cares. The stores don't care. No one cares. It's you. You better care about yourself because yep. no one else does. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. You know, to that point, I absolutely love this because a lot of times when I work with clients who have relocated from other countries, they've immigrated over here to the United States within two years, two years of consuming the standard American diet, which I call the sad diet, they immediately start developing autoimmune diseases. They start developing high cholesterol. They have high triglycerides, dysregulated blood sugars. And what usually gets their attention is the typical 20 to 30 pound or more weight gain that they've had in that very short two years. And so the sad thing is, is that here in the United States, this is how we're indoctrinating our children to eat from the beginning. And we're wondering why we have such increased anxiety, depression, we have, you know, all children getting diagnosed with diabetes as early as their teens now, uh, high triglycerides, fatty liver disease. My daughter, who is uh, 21 years old, just told me that her best male friend just got diagnosed with having fatty liver disease. I'm like, this is frightening. Where yeah. are we going with this? This generation of children have the lowest life expectancy of any generation yeah. that have come yet. Yeah. This is this is very scary. Yeah. So we as consumers, we have to start taking action right now. And one of the biggest things that we can do is be mindful of what we are putting in our mouth and what we are purchasing at the store to put into our mouth. So absolutely. This 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 conversation has just been so insightful. I know that the listeners are really like, wait a minute, <laughs> you've got my interest now. So tell me, what are three uh, what are three practical tips that the listener can walk away with today, implementing immediately? Okay, that's that's a great question. So number one is if you never even wanted to buy my book or go to my website, it's easy. It's it's easy to read. It's cheap. It's it's not complicated. There's things on there that will help you immediately. You need to evaluate the oil you have number one in your house. Okay. You need to smell and taste it, but you can't judge it unless you smell and taste something good next to it. Like we did in our class, we tasted the Costa Rica first. Mm -hmm. That was our Mm -hmm. benchmark of extra virgin. Then we tasted, I said, taste what you have at home. And if it's not as good as the Costa Rica, it may not be extra virgin. Okay. Get rid Uh of it. Fry with it or throw it out. Start over again. Don't ever bring bad oil in your house. So you need to be able to have a good bottle against the oil that you have at your house. Decide. Are you actually buying extra virgin? And if you're not, stop doing what you're doing and switch to something that is extra virgin. And we talked about how to evaluate that. Um, the second is that you need to have extra virgin at least two servings a day for, mm-hmm. for health benefits. Every nutritionist, every serious dietitian will tell you two tablespoons at 30 ml a day, whether it's on your salad, cook your eggs in a smoothie, um, mm-hmm. put it on your caprese salad, Raw is better than cooking because cooking it will kind of destroy the oil. But two tablespoons a day is not a lot of oil. You saw me taste one. That's one serving. Yeah. Have another yeah. serving somewhere. Get your two a day. If you have two servings a day, that's 30 mLs. In 30 days, that's 900 mLs. That's two bottles of this olive oil. So if you're buying a 500 ml or a 17-ounce bottle, and in your family of two or three people, this lasts months, 
you know you're not getting enough extra virgin olive oil. Simple. You need two bottles per month per person or you're not eating enough extra virgin olive oil. And that's the minimum. I'm not talking about the maximum. Then um, the third is that you need to start spreading the gospel. You need to talk to your family and talk to your friends. As we talked about a few minutes ago, um, nutrition is very much of a personal decision. But if you care about the people around you, give them a bottle, help them, give them my book, buy the book, give it, mm -hmm. you're done with it, pay it forward. You don't have to be a professional uh, olive oil expert like me to teach. You have to be able to learn something bring it into your life, and then share that knowledge with people that may not have the benefit of the knowledge that you've gained. They're not following your podcast, mm -hmm. or they're not looking at my website, or they're not even investigating all of them. If you care enough to do that, and I can tell you every single day I fill orders, I sell my product at cost because I want people to at least have access to something that's of quality. If you're nowhere else, if you live in a rural area and you don't have access, my website, the oils that I have on my website are 100% perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I don't carry them if they're not perfect. Where I live in this community um, is a is a nice country club kind of community. And in the restaurants, I would go there, and the olive oil was inedible, disgusting. And I said to the corporate chef, why do you allow this terrible olive oil in these restaurants where people are spending good money to live here and eat here? He goes, well, because they don't teach you about olive oil in culinary school, so we buy whatever is coming off of the food service truck. I said, that is not a good answer. So I said, let me do nope. a class for your chefs. And we did them all through the classes. They learn what olive oil is and isn't. These are trained chefs. At the end of it, mm -hmm. now they buy my olive oil and they use it all of their outlets here on the, in the place that I live. Because when people come here and want to have a good dinner, they can't have a disconnect. You can't have, you know, a $40 uh, entree and then have terrible olive oil that is totally disgusting. So mm -hmm. in your life, know the oil that you're using. And, and measure it against a quality product, number one. Use it frequently, at least twice a day, two servings a day, and then share that knowledge with people around you so that you're paying it forward to people that don't have the same initiative as you have had. Those mm -hmm. three things will set you on a course that will then lead to other foods that you may be talking about. Honey is terribly tampered with. Salmon yeah. is tampered with. Maple syrup. There's a lot of foods that you think the government regulates, and they don't. It's too I have it. Yeah, it's 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 horrible. I recently myself had a very unfortunate cir circumstance that occurred with some Chilean sea bass that yeah. was labeled as Chilean sea bass, brought yeah. it home, grilled it, ate it, and within hours I was deathly ill and excreting an orange oil from my rectum, which was frightening. And I go, yeah. I do the research and I discover this is a common practice here in the United States where manu our distributors are selling fish labeled as one thing, but it's not. And unfortunately, uh, with this particular fish, it was a product that was from uh, Australia, and most likely it was probably black snake mackerel that was labeled as Chilean sea bass because there's only 20 species of fish that could cause this kind of reaction in the human body, and Chilean sea bass is not one of them. Right. And when I went back to Costco, which is where I had purchased. I'm not a fan of Costco for many, many different reasons. But when I went back to take this fish, they would not assume any kind of responsibility. They wouldn't even refund my money back. I was, at, at, it was just devastating. Oh. So yes, the more we know, the better we can protect ourselves. Unfortunately, um, that experience that I had with that Chilean sea bass was uh, something that created a lot of problems for me in terms of my digestive health that is requiring a lot of work to restore and get back to where it was. So um, a lot of this can be avoided if we just know, you know, first and foremost, that the corruption exists. Right. And then secondly, knowing how we can take our power back and what to do and look for as consumers. Right. And I haven't even mentioned because I don't like to talk about what I call fake olive oil. Fraudulently mm -hmm. labeled olive oil is what we've been talking about, where it's mislabeled as extra virgin. It probably isn't. Fake olive oil is where they blend seed or nut oils with olive oil and sell it as extra virgin. That is even a bigger problem because people that have nut allergies or that keep kosher or halal um, mm -hmm. will be consuming something that isn't what they thought it is. And that could be not only 
you know, illegal and, and unethical, but extremely dangerous for people. Mm -hmm. um, and that does happen. Not a lot. There is fake olive oil. There's, it's been documented, but it's not a big problem. So I don't even talk about it in my book. But, you know, you're right. Whatever you see a sign on a product that says Chilean sea bass or salmon that looks like it's too orange to be really farm-raised salmon, they probably mm -hmm. hide it or some other kind of species, we have to take accountability for what we buy and what we eat because nobody's got our back. There, no. Uh, you can go to a Whole Foods. You can go to the best stores in the world. I've worked for those stores. They mean well, but when they have 15, 20,000 items in the store, there is no way they can police every single one of them. Right. Or the claims or the veracity of the product or you know, the healthfulness of the product or the freshness of the product. As a consumer, you better start to learn about food and take it seriously because you've got a long life ahead of you. And mm -hmm. the older you get, the more fragile your body becomes, the more sensitive to, you know, uh, tampering, artificial. So eating real food, eating fresh food. And if your listeners haven't made it to Europe, probably many of them have. But if you have, haven't, go to Europe now that COVID is behind us and spend a week in Italy eating, not in Rome, because our food in Rome is not great. Go into the countryside. Go into the provinces. Go into Spain, into Andalusia. Go into Greece and Crete and eat the local food and look at the difference of how you feel, how do your clothes fit, how do you sleep, and then when you get home and you automatically switch back to that terrible diet that we tend to have, you will see the difference mm -hmm. between how the rest of the world lives and why they have a longer life, even in poor economies, they have better quality of life than we have here in the most modern society with the most wealth and the worst diet. Mm -hmm. And that is completely no argument. That's 100% bankable, that we have the worst diet and the worst health numbers in the entire world, and we're the most wealthy economy. Absolutely. I mean, bottom line is, you know, it's it's corporate greed. It boils down to profit over well-being, and we don't have anyone to protect us other than ourselves. Yeah. So I, I just, I'm so in love with you. I think that you are just such an incredible human who is doing such good work. And as soon as I came across you, I knew immediately you had to come on the podcast. Thank you. I know the listeners are just mind blown right now. They're probably already Googling you, getting to your website. And if they haven't bought your book yet, they better do so because it is such an incredible resource to really help support your ability to gain the knowledge, gain the confidence to be able to go into the stores and take back that bottle of olive oil that is rancid and get your money back. So once the consumer has identified a good quality olive oil, how can they protect it? How can they, uh, you know, keep it as fresh as possible once they've twisted that cap off? That's a perfect question. I thank you for asking that because I probably would have forgotten, even though it's part of my, my mantra is, uh, first of all, when you look in the magazines or on TV shows, cooking shows, and you see the bottle of olive oil by the stove, okay, that's a, <laughs> a set. Those are, those are um, photo styled. Olive oil should never be by a stove or an oven or anywhere hot because olive oil, remember the halt, heat, air, light, time. Oh. Heat, stove, oven, hot. No bueno. It's automatically mm -hmm. destroy the olive oil. So it may be there for visuals, but do not leave your bottle by the stove ever, ever, ever. Um, when we open the bottle, like I did my little mini here, and I let mm -hmm. out, all bottles have nitrogen. Mine have nitrogen in here, which protects oxidation. Once mm -hmm. I stir the cap in, now I have sealed air in this bottle. The clock is ticking. So forget about this best before day. Forget about the bottle lasting, if it's a really good bottle, for a year or two unopened. Now you must use it within 60 to 90 days because the oil is going to start to decay. Uh, forget mm -hmm. about the heat. Forget about the light. We've let air in here. That's the other H or the A for air, we've let air in the mm -hmm. bottle. So when you open the bottle and you leave it on your table, when you leave the bottle open, all air is doing is coming in and out and it's tampering the oil. It's, def it's, it's ruining the oil. So what I do is I pour the oil what I need and I just put the cap right back on it. That seals the air out. There's still air inside, but you're not allowing air to constantly move. Not putting it in a cruet, those clear bottles that you, know, you see kind of a TJ Maxx with a little pour spout, mm -hmm. those are terrible. Mm -hmm. Okay, leave the oil in the original bottle. You do not need to put in a clear cruet. You do not need that pour spout that is open where air can come in and out of it. And it's got light, which is the L for halt. Light is a photosynthesis effect. It'll destroy the olive oil quickly. So again, leave it in its original bottle. And um, as I say on my bottle, and most good bottles will say, 
store away from um, light and uh, keep it in a cool in a cool place like your pantry. Okay, mm-hmm. in a pantry. So even though this bottle is dark green, it's not a hundred percent painted. Like the Costa Rica bottle that we tried was painted. It's hundred percent UV block. This is about a ninety five percent. I can see mm-hmm. through it a little bit. So there is still light coming in here. So keeping it in your pantry with the doors closed keeps the light out of it. Um, mm-hmm. And so once you open that bottle, no matter what size it is, if you're a small household, you need a small bottle. If you're a bigger household, you need a bigger bottle. If you're mm-hmm. the Waltons, you need those three liter tins at Costco that you don't want to chop at. But <laughs> right. that much oil. And use it within 30 days, 60 days max. If you think olive oil is gonna sit around for months and months and months, opened and, and you know closed and opened and closed and open, you're mistaken. It will go rancid. You need to know what rancid smells like and you must not use rancid olive oil because it's oxidized. So mm-hmm. keeping it away from light, heat and air, using it quickly so there's not a lot of time that's building up, buying the right size bottle for your household, empty the bottle, recycle it, get another bottle. And if you have a brand that you like and it's, it's a good brand, buy that brand over and over again. And if it's on sale, buy more of it, leave it unopened or give it as gifts. It'll stay fresh if it's a good bottle. And then when the new harvest comes, which is coming again in the fall, the Northern Hemisphere, the harvest in Europe, the, the base in the Mediterranean basin is Italy, Greece, and Spain are the big production countries. Starts early in October is the early harvest. The better quality starts early. And it goes to January, which is the late harvest. And the lower quality oils harvest later because the olives are bigger and riper, have more, more oil, but there's lower quality. And when you see a harvest date of 21, 22, the next one that I produce will be 22, 23. So this bottle is already now dated. It's still perfectly mm-hmm. good, but it's starting to get older. So don't buy more of this year than you need and wait for the new harvest. And what I do is I take pre-orders and people say, I want six bottles when the new harvest comes in from Spain. And I start filling those orders and they work on those bottles and say one a month, they have six months worth of oil. And then they order again before the end of the six months. And then they're good until the next harvest. So start mm-hmm. thinking about olive oil that way. That's a fresh harvest. It's an annual harvest. It doesn't last forever. It gets worse every single day that it's sitting around. Um, use it frequently. C- cook in with it. Use it raw. But don't let it sit in your cupboard and think that it's doing any good by sitting there. It's only getting worse. Absolutely. Gosh, David, thank you so much for all of these incredible tips. You are such a knowledgeable being who is just so easy to talk to. The information you deliver is just very digestive friendly. I can't speak enough for how much respect I have for you and your passion for this work, your ability to uh, deliver the truth in a consumer friendly way. I I just think you're the man. You are the EVOO man. You are you are that guy. So I truly appreciate you. Thank, Thank you for taking the you know time to come on to the podcast and share this information with the listeners. Where can they find you? Sure. So I make myself available, which a lot of people in my position would not want to do. Um, I don't have people. I don't have helpers. I do it myself. So evoguy.com, E-V-O-O-G-U-Y.com is my website. And if you want to just write me, it's simple. It's david at evoguy.com. So you can write me and say, hey, I've got a question. Or you can go to my website and you can connect with me there. Of course, I'm on Evo Instagram, uh, the Evo Guy. I'm on Facebook, the Evo Guy. Um, so you can catch me on social media. Um, on my website, you'll see a lot of the press. Once your your podcast is published, I'll put it on my press site so you can see a history of all my best um, best presentations, like with Kelly Clarkson and uh, Tom Papa. I've been on some really big national um, interviews this year. But I'm completely accessible, even though I'm busy. I want to be accessible because I know people have questions and my book will answer a lot of them. But in some cases, people have even more personal questions that my book doesn't answer. And it's just a quick email for me. I get 100 emails a day. I answer them. I move on to the next day. So they can get me any which way, website, social media, email. And um, I'm located in the East Coast. So, uh, you know, I I don't know where you're at. It sounds like you're Midwestern, but... um, I am from the Midwest, but I I reside here in Southern California. Okay, Southern Cal. So, you know, um, I I kind of start my day at, you know, 7 in the morning East Coast, and I'm done by 7 o'clock at night East Coast. So those 12 hours are pretty much when you'd hear from me. And um, I'm happy to hear from any of your your followers. And I'd love to do something with you again. So I hope you'll think about me. Oh, absolutely. 
to join Absolutely. you on the panel. Because um, we have to combat this corporate uh, fraud. It's just Absolutely. not right. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And this is such a, a, a real opportunity we have here as consumers to start demanding the change that we desperately need here in the United States. We're not headed in a good direction. It's, it's pretty dire. And I'll end it by saying, when you read my book, I don't mention by name any of the retailers that I've worked with, or sold to, or that I've encountered in my journey. But just know that they are from the very biggest to the littlest. Mm -hmm. Everyone in between, everyone, doesn't matter if they're health food, specialty, grocery, club, mass market, e-commerce, all of them do the same thing. And that is not put the customer first. And if they're not going to put the customer first, then you're a victim. Prepare to be victimized. You have the power to call them on their decisions. <laughs> Such wise words, my friend. Well, thank you so much, David. And I encourage everyone, run out and get this book. We have to support David. He shared with us on the conference how much money he had to pay out of pocket just to bring this book to life. And it's astronomical. You would just die if you knew how much he had to spend to bring this book to life. So let's support David and all of the work he's doing. Run over, visit his website, grab a copy, and then send any questions that you have to him. And I will definitely be in contact. We will be doing more together. I can promise that. Great. And they can go from my website. There's links to the Amazon page where there's the print book, the ebook, or the audio book if you want to listen to it while you're working out or driving. And also barnesandnoble.com. And I'm in some bookstores around the country. So it isn't just my website, but it's a portal to get to these other links. And I really appreciate you're a delightful person. You're extremely knowledgeable. Um, so, so enjoy spending an hour with you. And um, I look forward to hearing from the people that follow you and helping them in their journey as well. Ah, uh, thank you so much, David. Incredible. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Do me a favor, and if you loved this episode, please go leave a review. Reviews help make sure that this content reaches more people so that we can continue to heal as a collective. Remember to take a screenshot that you're listening and tag us on Instagram at Heather Barbieri RDN for a 15% discount on the Retrain Your Brain program. See you next time.